Welcome, friends, to lesson 18 of a friendly introduction to abstract algebra. And in today's video, we are going to learn a very important new concept. We're going to learn what a normal subgroup is. If you remember the last video, we saw that the factor set, if I take a subgroup H of a group G, does not automatically become a group under this natural operation, so-called coset multiplication. I simply take two cosets, left cosets, which are exactly the elements of this factor set, and multiply them by simply multiplying two representatives of these cosets and then taking the respective coset with respect um, to H. And we saw that this does not need to work when the group is non-commutative. And today we are going to learn a condition under which this actually works. And this leads to the notion of a normal subgroup. Okay, this is the content of proposition 20. As always, H is a subgroup of a group G. And H satisfies a special condition, namely that there is no distinction between left and right H cosets, meaning that for any arbitrary element of the group, these two sets here are the same. So GH, the left coset of G with respect to H, is the same as the right H coset of G. And before we continue, let me make a very important um, observation or remark about uh, this condition first. Okay, here it comes, the very important observation. We only know that these two cosets here are the same as sets, meaning this set here consisting of these elements, G times H, where H runs through the whole subgroup capital H, is the same set as this here, the right coset H consisting of H times G in the other um, order, where H again runs through the whole subgroup capital H. But this does not imply that element-wise these have to be the same. This is very important. So from this here you cannot deduce that, but only that if you consider such an element, G times H, that lies in here, then you know that it also lies in this set. And this means for this element here, I can find another element of capital H, H prime, such that these two here are the same. Because since these sets are the same, this here must lie in this set. This means it must be of this form, but it does not have to be the same H. Of course it can be, but it doesn't have to be. And of course, um, vice versa, for any H, I can find H times G is G times some H prime for H prime in capital H. So an example will make this even clearer, I hope. We consider the subgroup, the cyclic subgroup generated by a three cycle in S sub three which consists of three elements, the identity, sigma itself, and sigma squared. And if you feel the need to do some more computations with uh, permutations, please check all the details here yourself. So H is this subgroup here. Now we take this transposition, tau is 1, 2, and we calculate the left H coset of tau and the right H coset of tau. So I have to multiply all the elements of H, so these three elements, with tau from the left. Of course, with the identity, I end up with tau itself. Then I have tau sigma and then tau sigma squared. And this set turns out to be tau itself. Then this here gives me the transposition 2, 3, and this here is the transposition 1, 3. If I do the same for the right coset, H tau, I end up with tau, sigma tau and sigma squared tau. Now if I compute these, I end up with tau itself. This here gives me 1, 3 and this here gives me 2, 3. So as sets, 
These here are the same, obviously, they contain the same three elements, but for example, this element here is not the same as sigma tau. These are clearly different, but this element is the same as this here. So beware whenever you work with the equality of left and right cosets, you cannot infer this here, but simply this here. When you change the order here, you may end up with a different element of the subgroup H. Okay, now back to proposition 20. When H satisfies this condition, of course for every uh, small g in capital G, very important, then the so-called coset multiplication, which is given by this here, which I explained in the beginning, coset AH times coset BH is defined to be the coset of AB. So you simply take a representative of this coset, the easiest being A, of course, because the neutral element lies in H, so A is definitely an element of this coset. And here you may take, for example, B as a representative. You take their product in G, and then you take the left coset of this new element of G with respect to H. This is the so-called coset multiplication. Um, as a side note, in the last video I worked with a complete representative system of the cosets. This is indeed not really necessary and maybe causes confusion, but for the last video it's too late now. But here there's no need to work with a representative system. I can simply write down the cosets like that, whatever. So now the important part is this here is a well-defined operation. We're going to see what this means shortly. On the factor set G mod H, which consists exactly of these left cosets here. And this factor set becomes a group under this operation here. This is the content of proposition 20. So if you remember in the last video we asked ourselves this here doesn't work for every subgroup. Is there a, an additional condition on the subgroup such that this here works and gives me the structure of a group on the factor set? The answer is yes. It is exactly this here that the left and right cosets need to be the same for every element of the group. Okay, let's take a careful look at the proof. The hardest part being well-definedness of this operation. So let me tell you what this exactly means. It means that this here does not depend on the choice of representatives. Because to end up with this expression here, I have to choose a representative of this coset, in this case A, and a representative of this coset, in this case here B. But there are many different choices well, of course, depending on the size of H and the group, but if H is not the trivial subgroup, then this here contains at least two elements. So I have at least two choices for the representative here and here the same. And since I have the same cosets here, of course, the right side is not allowed to depend on the choice of representatives because then I wouldn't have a unique element um, for this product here, and this would not even be um, a map, a well-defined operation. So, meaning, pr more precisely, if I have two elements of G that have the same left coset with respect to H, and two elements B, B prime of G with the same left coset um, with respect to H, then it must not matter if I choose A or A prime or here B or B prime. So we need to show that ABH is the same left coset as A prime B prime H. Because only then this is a well-defined operation. I hope this was explained well enough. If you didn't understand it yet, please go back in the video one or two minutes and um, think about that some more because this is really important and it's always the main problem when working with factor structures like this. If 
I have a well-defined operation or map or whatever and this here always means that it does not depend on the choice of representatives. Okay, so let's prove this here. We take two different representatives of the coset AH and two different representatives of the coset BH and we need to end up with this here. So A prime of course is an element of A prime H but by assumption this is the same as AH. That means exactly that A prime can be written as A times H because it lies in here and by definition all the elements here look like that for some suitable um, H in capital H and of course the same for B prime and here I call this K a suitable element of H and of course K does not have to be the same as H. Then I take a look at the product A prime B prime. This here is A H, this here is B K and of course by associativity I need not worry about parentheses. I can just drop them or only set them or put them in when they are convenient. And now comes the important part. Here we have H times B and as explained before in great detail because these cosets are the same by assumption. And this is the important assumption about the subgroup H. This means HB can be written as B times H prime. Not B times H necessarily but there is an element H prime in H such that HB is BH prime. Then I have this here. Now I put in the parentheses. So I have AB and here I have the product of two elements of H because K is in H and H prime is in H and because H is a subgroup I know that this here is an element of H. So I know that this here, this product, is an element of the left coset of AB because it is of the form AB times an element of capital H. And then we showed some videos before if an element lies in this coset then its coset is the same as this coset. Well, we actually proved it for equivalence classes. If this here is an element of this equivalence class, uh, cosets are nothing but equivalence classes, then the equivalence class generated by this element is exactly this equivalence class here. So we end up with exactly one, what we wanted to show and now we have proven that this here is indeed a well-defined operation on the factor set because this condition here is satisfied by assumption. Okay, this was the hard part of the proof of Proposition 20. Now for the easy part. Once I know that this is indeed a well-defined multiplication or operation on the factor set, I can verify the group axioms pretty easily. Group axiom number one, associativity. Now here I'm being a bit lazy, but I think it's okay since we've done that multiple times before. We know that the operation here in G is associative and then I can simply say well then the operation on the factor set inherits this property of being associative because if I have AH, BH, CH here I have ABC here and then taking cosets and here I'm working in G so here I can move the parentheses any way I like and this translates to associativity of this product here. If you're a complete beginner, please pause the video and write that down for yourself. I'm not going to do that here. And although this is supposed to be a friendly introduction to abstract algebra, I think in uh, lesson 18 it's okay to lower the bar a bit. So raising the bar actually, not filling in every, every detail. Okay, we need a neutral element what could be the neutral element of this factor set? Well, of course, I take the left coset of the identity of G, which is nothing but H itself, but regarded as an element of the factor set, not no longer as a subgroup of G. So here in parentheses, why would this be the neutral element? I take any element of the factor set, which by definition is such a left coset, and then I multiply it with this element here, 
By definition of coset multiplication, this is g times e, and then taking the coset, but g times e, of course, is g, so I end up with g times h, the element I started with. And of course, the same um, in the other direction, or you could refer to the, this one exercise where we proved that being a right neutral element or in um, right identity um, suffices already. And last group axiom number three, every element of this factor set here needs to have an inverse. What is the obvious candidate for the inverse? Of course, it is the coset of G inverse. And here again, pretty simple calculation. This here times this, by definition of coset multiplication, gives me this, but G inverse, G is E, the identity of the group, and I end up with this neutral element here that was defined um, when verifying group axiom G2. And of course, the same in the other direction or citing the exercise that being a left inverse is already enough. And that's it. So we now have shown that if this condition here is satisfied, then this is a well-defined multiplication on the factor set and the factor set becomes a group itself. And as I've stressed many times before, this is one of the most important constructions of elementary abstract algebra, going to the quotient or taking the quotient set, or in this case, the quotient group. It's not really clear yet why, but it will become evident, I hope, in the next few weeks.